Let's get back to the tan lines. So uh, the when, when to tan, uh, I believe summer is the best time to get a tan. Those of you that wanted to know that, summer, write that down. He recommends summertime. And then that's when, but now why? And this is where we, we run into the wall a little bit. Why tan? Uh, some people believe that they're more physically attractive uh, when they have a tan. And then there's those of us <laughs> that know it's not going to improve anything, actually. <laughs> so my, bro- my older brother, um, Bruce, Bruce taught me, beauty is only skin deep, but ugly goes all the way to the bone. So I've always thought he, he meant that for me. But it helps us remember that true beauty is more than skin deep. True beauty has nothing to do with whether you have a tan or you do not have a tan. And then be, a tan can be deceiving. You know, when we're talking about hypocrisy, a tan can be very deceiving. You see, uh, girls, you see this guy with this rich tan. You think that he's some rich vacationer who's been spending his time on the beach. And his sleeve rolls up and you find out he's nothing but a dirty farmer. Isn't it tricky? Be careful, girls. You might not find some lazy guy you're looking for. You might end up with a hardworking man. So be careful about that. What's the tan got to do with it? See? Really really nothing, right? So, outwardly looking good has nothing to do with who God wants you to be. So that's that's all we're really going to look at today. If if you're not the person God desires you to be in your inner person, in your inner man, then a good tan isn't of any value whatsoever. The best place for us to start today is in God's Word. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 23 and look at this text. This is a passage of a series of woes that uh, Jesus prescribed to uh the uh, Pharisees, Matthew 23, verse 25, it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and greed. You blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, then the outside of them may also be clean." Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You're like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the memorials of the righteous, and say, If we lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have partaken with them in the shedding of the blood of the prophets. Therefore, your witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who committed the who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. These Jewish leaders placed a lot of value upon remaining ceremonially clean. In other words, creating the impression that they were very righteous, very religious people in wanting to appear uh, ceremonially unclean they were very very cautious about the things that they would touch and uh, the two things mentioned here uh, cup and platter and sepulchers were a couple things that they'd be very careful about touching Um, the outside of the cup needed to be ceremonially clean before a pharisee would touch it Jesus begins here an object lesson that's really pretty simple to understand. You don't have to be a Pharisee to understand about drinking from a polluted cup. I'm not even going to say what I'm thinking. All right. At least least you should know better. All right. Don't drink out of... If you take something out of the trash, don't drink coffee out of it. You know know better. All right. And 
and it's a simple object lesson when we talk about washing dishes. So everybody in these sections, you guys know how to wash dishes. Someday, folks, you'll also learn to wash dishes. And there's a right way to do it. And uh, my dad taught me when I was young. My dad said, you know, when you're rinsing them with the final rinse, always rinse the back of the plate before you rinse the inside of the plate because then you don't have to rinse it twice because it saves you time. Good idea. It's not how my wife does it. My wife does a lot of things wrong around the house like that. Uh, I've tried to teach her over the years. But, you know, I was young when I learned to wash dishes, but now if you come to my house... It's like a game. You take a cup out of the cabinet and you look inside it to see. <laughs> because like I said, I had a birthday. I'm 56. Have you noticed my glasses? I'm extremely nearsighted. I have astigmatism. Now that I'm 56, I require a floodlight to see what's stuck on the inside of a dish. So if you come to my house, and I do wash dishes... And I've washed the dishes and they've been put in the cabinet. It just pretend it's a fun little game. Nope. Nope. Winner. All right. Let's have some coffee. That's, this is how we do it at my house. Maybe at your house it's different. But when you turn 56, it'll be the same way. I guarantee you. How we wash dishes. So we know it's a simple object lesson. But Jesus was talking about three different kinds of uncleanness. You know, the physical dirt that could be inside of a cup. I've already mentioned the ceremonial uncleanness that could come from a, a Pharisee touching a cup that hasn't been properly washed. If you want to see something interesting, see how conser these conservative Jewish people will wash their hands in certain ways. There's videos available to see how they It's unbelievable the things they'll go through to make sure their, their hands are already clean, but there's certain ways and in order to do it in, same thing with the cups and platters. It was ceremonially unclean if it wasn't done in a certain way, in a certain order, the water flowing a certain direction and so on. I, I could never accomplish it. But the third type of uncleanness I, that Jesus is talking about here, and he's contrasting ceremonial cleanness with a spiritual uncleanness. He says specifically that this cup is filled with two things extortion, and self-indulgence. Those, for a religious leader, those are actions that are ex extremely self-centered actions. To take advantage of others for your own gain, your own glory, your own profit, extortion, and self-indulgence. I've already mentioned my problem with cookies, but... These sins start as a matter of the heart because they're self-centered attitudes. But remember, these are actions. So we're not just talking about a spiritual uh, uncleanness. We're also getting down to our attitudes that come out in actions. It's not just enough to believe the Bible. We have to live what it says as well. So they, the Pharisees are so concerned about this platter being clean. They would actually drink from a cup that was dirty inside if it was ceremonially clean on the outside. Don't judge them too harshly spiritually. And in our lives, we kind of do the same things. And Jesus is pointing at this disparity between their words and their deeds. In fact, he starts this chapter with five verses that say, uh, Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, this is Matthew 23, verse 1 and verse 2. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do their works. Don't copy what they do. For they speak, but do nothing. They speak, but do nothing. They fasten heavy loads that are hard to carry, lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with their finger. They do all their works to be seen by men. They do all their works to be seen by men. Those types of works are not the works that are going to work God's work. 
We need to bring both our words and our actions into agreement. Amen. Outwardly, Jesus talks about the beauty. Uh, the, the sepulchers were uh, uh, tombs. Now remember, the, the Pharisees like to be ceremonially clean. Especially if you're coming to Jerusalem, celebrate Passover. You would not be allowed to celebrate Passover if you touched something like a, a gray, dead men's bones are inside. Do you remember the story of Samson? How that he violated God's law because he touched the dead lion and got the honey out. The same type of idea of ceremonial uncleanness is what they wanted to keep. They wanted to be able to come into Jerusalem, have Passover. But if somehow they accidentally let their robe touch a grave or a tomb, they wouldn't be allowed. You're ceremonially unclean. Were they clean, unclean physically? No. But the ceremony of everything, the appearances that they had to keep up to do that. So they would take uh, dust from lime and mix it up into a white paint. And they would paint the sepulchers. It'd be a warning. And the sepulchers would be all beautiful now. But it's a warning. Don't touch it so you'll be ceremonially clean. That's how they would adorn them. And even though they looked pretty, Jesus used that as an illustration here of what is true beauty. It's not looking beautiful on the outside. I grew up in the day and age when preachers would preach against wearing makeup. And uh, now I live in a day and age when preachers do wear makeup. So <laughs> uh, it's interesting. The changes. Let me get back to my sermon here. We're, we're obsessed in our, our culture with outward beauty. What if we could get such an obsession about inner beauty to deal with things like righteousness and loving one another and preaching the gospel? I mean, I can go on all day about things that, that the inner beauty of things. But what is true beauty? It's definitely not just a whited sepulcher. We need to stop devoting so much of our resources to our appearance. And it's not just, I'm not just talking physical appearance now. We devote a lot of our resources to looking like what a Christian should look like. I know some of you say, he ought to devote a little more time to look like what a Christian looks like. I know that's what you're thinking, right? But we spend a lot of time with the appearances. But what goes on deep inside or what goes on behind the scenes is a little bit different. What goes on in our, our homes, with our families... What does God see in you? What's inside your cup? What's, is, is it like a, a tomb of dead men's bones inside? We need to see ourselves and others the way that God sees us and them. You remember the story in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, when... The prophet Samuel wanted to anoint a new king. The first king, King Saul, was not behaving properly. He wasn't following God. So God said, we're going to anoint a new king. Samuel had in his mind what he was looking for. And when Eliab, David's big brother, good looking guy. Eliab was really good looking. When he walked in, Samuel thought, this is the Lord's anointed. And here's how God stopped him. 1 Samuel 16 verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart when we talk about the Lord looking on the heart, we're talking about the Lord looking at what our true person is. 
who we really are as a man or a woman, what we are inside, what we are in private when nobody's looking except God and what God sees in us. And you see how this thing plays in a positive and a negative way. We judge people by appearance, and then we turn around and we want people to, to judge us by our appearance, not by how we actually live our lives, not really by the deeds we do or by the words we use. I've said this before, but you know, please don't, if you have access to my Facebook wall, please do not judge me by what people post on my wall. There's language that people post, somehow gets on there. I don't know. I'm friends with sinners and pagans and some of you Christians too. But I, I, like, I like sinners a lot. I really do. And uh, their language is, is not acceptable. You know, but it is on Facebook. Why is that? How come you can use that word on Facebook? I do not know. Maybe because Facebook also starts with an F. I do not know why. But... Let me get off of that. I don't really want to talk about Facebook. Hey, but if that's, what, if that's where your inner man is coming out, you got a problem. Um, when your heart is right with God, your actions will follow. This is what Jesus is saying to us. It's not just our appearance, it's our heart. There's a lot of bumper stickers and, and posters that I found about this topic. Everybody knows, uh, practice what you preach. And someone changed it to, practice what you preach or don't preach at all. Practice what you preach or change your speech. It's like a little rap thing. Practice what you preach before you decide to teach. Also a little poem. You can preach a better sermon with your life than with your lips. Of course, you have to misspell then, you know, if you do that one. Uh, your beliefs do not make you a better person. Your behavior does. Taste your words before you spit them out. The advice you offer is the advice you need to follow. The best way to succeed in life is to act on the advice you give to others. And it's not necessarily true, but it conveys an emotion that you feel, right? Everybody knows this one. Actions speak louder than words. Walk the talk. People watch what you do more than listen to what you say. You do not have the right to hold someone accountable for standards you refuse to apply to yourself. I like this one. Your most powerful testimony is how you treat others after the church service is over. Yay! <laughs> They're going to buy me lunch, I think. So. You know what that means. And here's what I, I really don't like at all. Going to church does not make you a Christian any more than standing in a garage makes you a car. Okay, it, it's the same. You, there used to be the sermon, just because kittens are born in the oven doesn't make them biscuits. You know, you, that, but what I know the idea of that little sermon blurb there is that People coming to church are not all really Christians. It's saying your actions show outside of church that you're not really a Christian coming to church. But let me tell you what's wrong with this. Coming to church can make you a Christian. Standing in the garage cannot make you a car. I'm sorry to burst your bubble. Coming to church can make you a Christian. Why do you think we're here? So I, that one I don't really like. Um, I, I actually have a, a saying that I, I made up. It says, uh, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than McDonald's can make you a cheeseburger. You see what I mean? I forgot that I had written that one one time. You guys should have a book of all these good collections, you know, of sayings that I've made up. You want to help me write that book, Kara? Things Pastor Zach said. Uh, where was I at? Oh, the Alice in Wonderland one. I give myself very good advice, but I very seldom follow it. Words may lie, but actions always tell the truth. And I like this one. It said it was an African proverb, I don't know. 
Be careful when a naked man offers you a shirt. It's a good message though, isn't it? Spiritualize it. Right? Do not think that teaching someone to be good will take less effort than practicing it. An ounce of practice is worth more than tons of preaching. He, Mahatma Gami may or may not have said that. You know how it is on the internet. Maybe he said it. This one, I, I don't believe Ralph Waldo Emerson said this one, but it's the internet version of what he said, okay? What you do speaks so loud that I cannot hear what you say. And I saw this one. It was a good one. You cannot purify water by painting the pump. And then one that I spent an hour and a half on, Peter Kraft, Catholic apologist, he said, hypocrisy is propaganda. Okay, search that one. Find Peter Crave's website, go to his page on, on Machiavelli, and find the context. I spent an hour and a half just on that one quote. That's all the time we're going to spend on today, though. Because bumper stickers like this, they don't change who we are. Uh, if, you, if you'll notice, I don't wear a lot of slogans. When you see me in a t-shirt, it's a plain t-shirt. It's a plain shirt most of the time. The, the only slogan I've worn recently was from Kids Club this summer, uh, uh, God Can Do Anything. You know, I wore that one all, all summer long. But most of the time, I don't have a slogan on my shirt because I don't want someone looking at me thinking that I have this outward message, but inwardly, I'm a hypocrite. I'm not practicing what I preach. For the Christian, unlike the Pharisees, who didn't have this type of faith. For the Christian, I've got good news now. We're wrapping it up. No, that's not the good news. The good news is there are three cleansing agents that we have. One, the blood of Jesus Christ. You're supposed to say amen on that one. Amen. Uh, wouldn't it be great if as a preacher... I could come up here and say, I've never committed a sin. I have resisted every temptation to lie, cheat, steal, lust. I've lived a perfect life by the power of God. That would be a lie. The truth is, I have. But the other truth is that the blood of Jesus Christ takes away sins. There is nothing else that will cleanse your sins than the blood of Jesus Christ. The second cleansing agent that you have access to because you have faith in Jesus Christ is the amazing power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, also called the Spirit of Holiness. The Holy Spirit works in us to make us holy daily. Your walk, your grind, when people try to wear you down, so you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will empower you to live a consistent, coherent Christian life. And the third, you go to Psalm 119. It's got so many wonderful things in Psalm 119. I, uh, I had to memorize it in the old King James. I'm that old. I read the old King James. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to thy word. Do you know what that means? That the word of God can cleanse your life. If you are struggling with hypocrisy, that the things you believe are not the things you do, that the, the word of God is not the thing that you Follow and act out and perform in your life. You need these three things. Ask Jesus Christ to cleanse you from your sin by his blood. Ask the Holy Spirit on a daily, unless you're like me, an hourly basis. Minute by minute. All right. A minute by minute basis that the Holy Spirit would empower you to live for Jesus Christ. That people would see in you not a wishy-washy fraud. That here I am, praise the Lord, and then out 
on my own. I'm just as big a sinner as everybody else. I need the Holy Spirit. You see what I am here? Imagine me without the Holy Spirit. Ooh, that'd be ugly. That would be bad. I listen to the Holy Spirit minute by minute through the day. And God's Word has been the most powerful influence in my life, a book unlike any other book to transform my life. I've done a lot of reading recently. I've been, I, like I said, I read stuff by Peter Kraft. I read stuff by Machiavelli. I didn't get very far in Il Principe because I don't speak Italian. But I read a little bit of it, and I was back reading some things that Margaret Sanger said. And, ah. and then I turn over to God's Word, and He begins to cleanse my heart, and it changes who I am, and it helps me to act in accordance who God wants me to be. We need to pray. An example of our prayer can be found in God's word. Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Memorize that. You don't have the advantage of knowing the old hymn. How many of you know the old hymns? You know the old hymns? Uh, Search me, O God, and know my heart, I pray. You guys, how many knows that old one? Did you know it was written to an old drinking song from World War I? It was. They took an old popular pub song and they put beautiful words to it. Look that one up. Search me, oh God. Let's say it. Let's say this out loud. Will you say this prayer with me? Search me, oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me And lead me in the way everlasting. In Matthew 23, Jesus pointed out the problem of the Pharisees. That outwardly they were righteous. But inwardly they were hypocrites and full of iniquity. When we live consistent, coherent Christian lives, we will have an impact on our culture. Bumper stickers, t-shirts, and politics won't change our culture as much as as if we, through the blood of Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the power of His Word, if we will live consistent Christian lives. When God changes us, we become a positive influence on the culture that we live in. Let me tell you a secret. You are an influence on the culture even if you are still a hypocrite. If your heart is full of iniquity and you declare you're living for God, you are an influence on the culture. It's just not a very pretty one. It's not a good one. We need to be creating culture. We need to be changing it, not following it. And that's also at the heart of this message. We as Christians need the power of God in us 